Hi, everybody. This is Emily Adams. I will be walking you through workshop one, which is general case tips and strategies. This is essentially consulting case interviewing 101. Now, I know that a lot of you may be familiar with the concept of a case interview, while some of you may never have heard of this before. So in some cases, this may be review, and in some cases, this may be brand new content. Feel free, if you have questions as I go through this, to write down those questions. And next time you meet with your career coach, you'll have an opportunity to speak with them and address those questions that you have. So just to give you a little background on who I am, um, my name is Emily Adams. I am a former for-profit consultant. I say that because now I'm in the nonprofit world. Um, and I spent nearly four years at Ernst & Young, currently a nonprofit consultant at New York. And in between, I went and got my MBA at Munich Business School. A lot of students asked me if I had to do that to continue in my career, and I did not have to do that. I did that for my own benefit. But if that's something that's really important to you, very important to understand if the company will pay for that or if they encourage people going to get their MBA. So that's just a little bit about me. I have had multiple experiences interviewing. I have interviewed across a wide range of consultancies from the big four to the traditional management consultancy firms when you think of McKinsey, Bain, or BCG. And I did another round of interviews when I was transitioning over to the nonprofit sector. So this is something very near and dear to my heart. So just to walk you through our agenda for today, we're going to go through what is consulting. It's a term that's thrown around a lot, and I think oftentimes when I ask a student, describe to me what consulting is in layman's terms, they get stuck because it's elusive. So we're going to talk a little bit about what consulting truly is. Then I'm going to go into the case interview. So oftentimes in an interview with a consultancy, you're going to have a behavioral interview. You're going to have a technical interview, which is more about the industry that you're interviewing for. So, for instance, if you're a financial consultant, they're going to ask you about the finance industry. And then a case interview. And a case interview can come in many forms, but it's traditionally a problem that a company is having, and they're looking for you to break down the problem and come up with a solution. So it's a bit longer. And we'll go through some examples later in this workshop. Then I'm going to break down for you the 13 commandments of case interviewing. Now these 13 commandments come from Case in Point. It's a book that I will reference several times throughout the workshop. And the reason for this is, and there's infinite literature on case interviewing, as I'm sure you've noticed if you've done any research on this. But we think that this is a really good book to start with. It gives you a fairly comprehensive overview on the case interview and walks you through some really good practice examples that you can do either by yourself or with a roommate or with a friend that's willing to sit with you for 45 minutes. Then we're going to talk about the types of case interviews. So there are multiple different types of case interviews, and certain firms prefer to use certain case interviews, and certain firms gravitate to other types. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we get to that point. I'm going to introduce some frameworks and equations, talk about how you get started. Most people find that to be the most challenging. And then talk about what to do if you get stuck. It is not the end of the world if you get stuck. It happens quite frequently in the interviews that I've been part of. And we're going to talk about how to get unstuck. So diving right in, management consulting is the creation of value for organizations. So you use your knowledge, you use techniques, you use the different assets that your team brings to improve an organization's performance. One thing I will say about this that I throws a red flag up to me when I am interviewing either students or experienced hires is, when they say that consultants are smarter than their client or they're there to tell the client something they don't know. And the reason that throws up a red flag is consulting is collaboration. It's partnership with a client. I think it's uh, not always a fair assumption to know as a consultant or to think as a consultant that you know more than the person in the role that you're trying to help. So very important to highlight that in an interview or when you're speaking to somebody about what consulting is. So why consulting? Why do people get into this field? You're all here because you have some sort of interest in it. And I just wanted to call out a few things that have made the career incredibly rich for me. So you work with smart people. That's very important. And people that are energized by problem solving. So if you're the type of person that likes to come up with solutions to problems, this is a great field to be in. 
you get exposure to various industries at a very young age. So I had the experience of being in financial services, but I also touched on textiles. I touched on entertainment. I touched on different manufacturing companies, some a bit more sexy than others, I understand. But very good to understand what different industries look like and which that you might have interest working in if you ever decide to jump into industry. You get to work with very senior executives, and this is something that doesn't always happen for more junior employees, so it's a real privilege to be able to work with clients and work with senior management on the client team and understand how they work, see how they manage people, learn from them. It's a constant learning process. Every new project that you go on will be something different. So I always tell people that the first day on a new project is a bit anxiety-inducing, but it's also like the first day of school or the first day at a new job. It feels very exciting, and you learn on the job. You get marketable skills, which is great. Um, I think it opens the door for a lot of future opportunities. You get variety, including the people you work with. They change all the time, which is great. Um, and you get to work with a variety of different people. And then, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the money is good. So it's something that provides a fairly stable career, and there are always opportunities for consulting, even when the economy is good or when it's bad as well. So this case question. A lot of students think that consultancies use the case question solely to torture students, and it's not the case. Really what they're looking for is a number of characteristics in a potential applicant. So I've listed a few here. They're looking for, are you curious? Can you listen? Are you confident? Linked to that, are you good under pressure? So case interviews can be very stressful. You have somebody much more senior looking at you, asking you questions about a hypothetical problem that a hypothetical organization is facing. Um, can you keep your composure under pressure and stay poised? How are your analytical skills? A lot of the cases that you are going to probably come across have some sort of mathematical component or some sort of data analysis. Fairly simple, but enough to challenge you in that high-pressure environment. And are you creative? Again, under this amount of pressure, are you thinking only in the box and thinking of only very traditional solutions? Or are you able to step back and present an idea that's a little out of the box, a bit more creative? So we'll go into the 13 case commandments. And the ones that I've starred are the ones that I feel that students struggle with the most. So listening to the question, I really, really mean this one too. A lot of times because you're so nervous, or maybe you're not, but most students are very nervous when they're going through the case interview for the first time. It's important to listen to what the interviewer is actually saying. And related to that, taking notes, very important. One, it shows the interviewer that you're organized. Two, if you do get nervous, it's a great way to capture information and refer to it later on. As I said, the case interview can be a fairly long process. Sometimes I've been in case interviews that last a full hour for one case. So had I not taken detailed notes and made logical notes, I wouldn't have been able to refer back to them 30 minutes into the case when I needed to. Make sure you summarize the question for them. So what I hear you saying is X. That way, if you're off target or if you misheard them, it gives the interviewer up front an opportunity to correct you before you start solving for the wrong question. Make sure that you understand what they're really asking for. If I tell you that we're not growing, that's very different than our sales are down. So make sure you truly understand the objective. Oftentimes, there is more than one objective. So you're not only looking where the company should grow, how big should they grow, through what channels should they grow. So make sure you've clarified all of the objectives. Ask questions. A lot of students don't want to look or be perceived as if they're not competent, so they won't ask questions up front. It's a huge mistake. If you don't have clarity on something, make sure you ask it as soon as possible. If you wait and ask it in the middle of solving the case, it'll indicate to the interviewer that you weren't comfortable asking questions that you needed clarification on up front. And organize your answer. A lot of students ramble, so they go on and on and on about what they think the 20 things the organization could do. 
that doesn't show a lot of analysis and it doesn't show a lot of poise. Bucket your answers, structure your answers as is possible. I think there are three main solutions here. One, two, three. It allows the interviewer to follow your thought process and it also shows that you can break down complex problems. Next, think before you speak. So instead of just speaking, um, make sure that you've thought about what's coming out of your mouth. A lot of students get very excited, they have an idea. So make sure that you think about what you're saying. If you need to take some time, that's absolutely fine. Um, ask for that time though. So say, may I take a minute to think about this? Be sure to manage your time well. So make sure you understand what time frame you're working in. If you have an hour for a case interview, you don't want to be still asking clarifying questions 15 minutes in. So just be sure to manage your time. Work the numbers. A lot of students like to give estimations rather than actually doing out the calculations. There are some cases where estimations are appropriate, but most of the time they're looking to test your analytical skills, so they want you to do the numbers out. Be coachable. So this is something that really throws students off who haven't had a lot of practice in the case interview. So for instance, if I give a solution and an interviewer challenges me, it's my job to think about what they've said, and I can go two directions, being thoughtful with both. I've thought about what you said, but I'm still going to go with my answer because X, Y, Z. Otherwise, if they presented something to you that you didn't think of, that you think has weight, has legs, you can say, that's a great point. I didn't think about that. Taking that into consideration, I would like to slightly alter my answer and go in this direction because of X, Y, Z. So make sure you're coachable. That's not a sign of weakness. That's actually a strength. Be creative and brainstorm. So feel comfortable brainstorming and use your paper again. Take notes. Write down things. When it comes time to discuss with the interviewer some of the things that you've thought of, say, here are some more traditional solutions, but I also have considered these two solutions that are maybe a little bit more out of the box. Energy and positivity. Positivity will get you a very long way in the early stages of your career because it shows that you're curious and that you want to solve the problem. And then bring closure and summarize. The worst thing that a lot of students do is they do wonderfully during the case interview. They've structured out their thought. They deliver an answer seamlessly, but they stop in a place that's not natural, and they don't give closure, and they don't summarize the case. So make sure you say, the objective was X, Y, Z, and these are the solutions I present. Next steps would be X. Thank you. And let them know you're done. Summarizing it for them will help them remember you and leave a good taste in their mouth. types of cases. So I mentioned earlier that different firms like to typically focus on different types of cases. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are four of the most common types of cases. Brain teasers, I'm sure everybody knows what a brain teaser is. These are becoming less popular. Now, sometimes I'm seeing banks use these, um, and some consultancies still use these to see if someone feels comfortable thinking on their feet, but um, not as common anymore. Market sizing is something that I think no matter what, you are going to come across in some form or fashion. We'll go through what each of these mean and give an example in just a second. Factor questions. So what this means is what factors would you consider when opening a restaurant in Beijing? So breaking down the different considerations of a business decision. And then business cases, and that's very generic, but it's essentially what is happening to an organization, and identifying why it's happening and providing solutions. So let's go through a couple examples now. Here we see a brain teaser. A man goes to a hardware shop and asks price an item. The shopkeeper replies that the item is one for a dollar. The man gives the shopkeeper three dollars for 600. What did the man buy for his newly painted house? Now a lot of students hate these, but the important thing here is to see how creative that you can be with your answers. Write down what they say. Again, clarify if you got the information right. 
And then just try to think through it. These aren't things that you can prepare for necessarily, though there are great lists online of different types of brain teasers, and you might want to practice them. But it's more are you able to think on your feet and are you able to be creative on the spot. For market sizing, it's estimating the size of a market. So, for instance, estimate the annual market size for Internet routers in the commercial segment in the U.S. So it's a hypothetical. Sometimes market sizing is embedded in a larger case, a larger business case. I see that quite often. And sometimes they're standalone. And what they're trying to do here is work with your ability to logic through a bigger problem and estimate estimate numbers. So we'll give an example of that later on. But this is one to practice. It's very important. One thing you want to clarify with the interviewer is if it's talking about um, an item or a product, make sure you understand the units they're asking for. Are they asking for the market size in terms of dollars or a currency? Or are they asking for amount, so a number amount? Make sure you understand that. Factor question. So we gave this example earlier, or an example or similar example similar to this. What factors would you consider when making a recommendation to fast food burger chain, or whether or not they should expand to Latin America? This is something I see almost 100% of the time with big four consulting interviews. They're fairly generic questions, and they're looking for your ability to come up with a lot of different solutions. And most importantly, how do you bucket those solutions? So I think there are five different types of things that I would consider, and here are three sub-bullet points for each of those categories. The business case is a bit bigger. So sometimes it's just a number case. So our total cost is this amount. Rent expenses are this percent. What are our rent expenses? And they're really looking for you to just crunch numbers. Here there's a lot of tricks that you can use, being comfortable with using 10% and multiplying that by 4% or other tricks that we will go into more in actually workshop two. But here they really do want you to solve it out. Use pen and paper. I will say this over and over again, but use your pen and paper and show them how you're doing the calculations. It's important that it's accurate. Do they want it to be quick? Of course, that's ideal. But they'd rather that it be accurate. Something that I will mention later, but key to mention now too, you will not have a calculator during your case interview. So make sure that you get comfortable doing the calculations with pen and paper. And then an operational case. And these are the big, bigger business cases that I mentioned before. GE has invented a light bulb that never burns out. What price would you recommend to price the new product? So that's a larger case. You're going to have to ask a lot of questions of the interviewer. You're going to have to get a lot of information. And you're going to have to break the problem down into smaller components. One thing I'd like to say before we move on is, in addition to those types of case interviews, there are two types of case formats, one of which is interviewer-led. So they're going to ask you, give you some information up front, lay out the scenario and the context, and then they're going to ask you a series of questions, which you'll need to respond to given the information that you have. The other type of format is interviewee-led. Interviewee-led interviews are much more difficult. So in those types of interviews, the interviewer would give you a very generic statement, and it would be the interviewee's job to ask a series of questions to collect all the information they need in order to find a solution. And the reason that that's more complicated is you have to know which questions to ask. You have to know which content you need to answer the question. I find that in introductory or entry-level positions, I've rarely seen interviewee-led cases. McKinsey tends to do them occasionally, and then also BCG and Bain. The big four typically do interviewer-led. I think it's easier for the interviewer, and I think it's easier for the interviewee. So just be mindful that there are two different types. And I think that in case in point, they typically um, – do majority interviewer-led, but practice a couple interviewee-led. They're online. So moving into frameworks. Frameworks are just a basis for how to analyze a problem. Some of you may be familiar with some of the frameworks I've listed here. 
and some of you may not. I've highlighted the ones that appear most frequently in the cases that I've come across and in the interviews I've come across. But make sure that if you don't know any of these or some of these look unfamiliar, you write them down and look them up. Having a good understanding of the frameworks gives you a solid tool set. I call these like your tools when you go into the case interview to pull from. Some will be more appropriate than others to use depending on the case that's given. These are what are in the consulting world considered probably two of the most basic frameworks. And they're called the five C's and the four P's. When you're analyzing a situation, you can use these. So in the four, five C's, you have company, channels, clients, competition, and cost. These are some of the things that you would consider when thinking about the health of a firm, growing a firm, their profitability. So if you ever get stuck, think to yourself, okay, I, I need to run through the five C's or the four P's. The four P's are product, promotion, price, and place. And these have more to do with the success of a certain product. So what are you selling? What are the promotions? What is the price point? And where are you selling it? So these are just some tricks to keep in the back of your mind and to pull from if you do get stuck. I've included the BCG matrix because I found that a lot of students actually don't cover this. Um, it used to be something that students were much more familiar with. But the BCG matrix was created, no surprise, by BCG. And it's to understand, one, where a product falls in your product portfolio. So if you're a company that has three or four products, what is this one product? So if you have high market share and a high growth rate, it's a star. It's an all-star product. If you have low market share but a high growth rate, it's a question mark. Not sure how it's going to perform. High market share and low growth rate is a cash cow. And then obviously relatively low market share and low growth rate it's a dog. So if a product is consistently performing poorly and is in this dog area, then that's probably something you might want to consider no longer providing as an organization. Also, it might be interesting to funnel money or helpful to funny, funnel money from the cash cow product, so funds that you get from the cash cow product, into the question mark to see if they'll grow into an all-star. So it's one, about how a product is currently performing, and two, it's a question of where to invest across your portfolio of products. If that's not clear to you, there are a lot of examples online of products being analyzed in this way. I would suggest going through an example of that. Porter's Five Forces is something that most of you should be familiar with. Most people cover this in a marketing class, but I've heard of it happening in strategy classes as well. It's understanding their market viability of a product. So if I come up with a product, am I going to be successful? So some things you want to think about. Threat of new entrants. So are other people able to come in and deliver this product or service? Is, is it a viable threat? The bargaining power of the buyers. So do the buyers of my product have the ability to negotiate me down in price? Do they have the ability to seek alternatives, thus my power is slightly diminished? Are there threats of substitutes? So if I'm a burger joint, are people equally happy with a grilled cheese joint down the street? So are there other products that would serve these people's needs? Bargaining power of suppliers. So no matter what I create, I have to have materials. So I'm going to be sourcing from other people. Do my suppliers and the vendors I source from have power? And that would affect how much I have to pay for the materials and would affect how much I have to charge. And at the end of the day, would affect my profitability. How much am I actually earning from this? You also want to think about rivalry among existing competitors. And this one, to me, is the most no-brainer. You don't want to enter what's considered a red ocean. So a good example for modern day is car services. So I live in a big city. I live in New York. And Uber is all the rage. But there are a dozen, at least, other affordable car services that have entered the market. And it's absolutely saturated now. So if I were thinking about coming into New York with a car service, I would realize there are a lot of competitors here. My chance of being successful is probably pretty slim. I might want to go to an area that's considered a blue ocean, where there aren't a lot of competitors already in existence that have an established client base. 
So these are five things that you'd want to consider when thinking about launching a new product or service or about entering a new market. If you remember one thing from your training today, I would suggest that this be the slide that you focus on. So this is the profitability breakdown. And this is the tree that you will refer to time and time again. The star here is that goal of most firms, and again, I'm going to highlight most for-profit firms, probably because I'm working in the nonprofit sector at the moment, but also because if you're interviewing with McKinsey, Bain, or BCG, I've seen them do interviews that are around a nonprofit company. And if that's the case, profitability is not the main priority. It's mission. So be sure you note that. But in a traditional for-profit consultancy, the goal is to maximize profits. Profits are composed of two things. So it breaks down logically here, and this is exactly the kind of structure that they would want to see on a piece of paper that you jot out. So the profit is made up of your revenue and your costs. I hope that most of you know that by now. But then, of course, your revenue is broken down to the units you sell and the price per unit, or the revenue per unit. And then on the cost side, you have to have variable and fixed costs, fixed costs being the cost that you incur no matter how many you produce and variable costs being per unit. So that's made up of the number of units sold and the cost per unit. So this framework will help you when they ask you questions about we're not as profitable as we used to be, what's happening? So having this framework up, you can break down the different components based on the information they give. You can ask them questions about what's happening with revenue and what's happening on the cost side. And once you get information to populate this tree, you can understand where the problem is. For some of you, you might be interested in interviewing for a technology consulting position. So a lot of times consultancies um, especially the big four, they actually have different positions for people that are focused on business programs and business consultancy and technology consultancy, so working with IT and different tech solutions. Sometimes the groups are mixed in the big four, so IT individuals work with the business process people, um, and sometimes they're entirely different projects. But wanted to at least present this slide to help anybody who is interested in the technology side of the house. This is probably the most important framework for anyone interested in technology, and it's the project life cycle of a consulting engagement, a typical consulting engagement. So for every technology project, typically you go through these five stages. So discovery and planning, that's for everybody, um, business and technology. You have to understand the problem. You have to understand the context of the problem and understand the organization before you can really start diving into a solution, understanding the problem being at least half the battle. Then there's a design component. So you start designing the technical specifications to meet the client's needs. You develop what you design. Then you have to test it. You're not going to launch um, a solution before you've thoroughly tested it. And then you do what's called go live, which is actually launching the technology. Another thing to note is that in both cases, both if you're interested in strategy and operations or if you're interested in technology, it's very important to have ongoing support and change management. And you've probably heard that term, and it's gotten a lot more attention in the last couple of years. Change management is helping the client understand the changes that are happening with the work that you're delivering. So in some cases, you might come into a program and deliver a solution that's going to change employees' everyday behavior and what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So you want to make sure that you note that, that you help deliver the training that's necessary to get them up to speed, and that at every stage, they feel like they understand what's happening. Because if you deliver a wonderful solution, but nobody's been trained to continue it or to implement it further, the solution will ultimately fail. So something that's very important for consultants on both sides of the house to be able to speak about and to understand. So I won't go through all of these, but I just wanted to mention that these are the typical calculations that you are going to come across in basic case interviewing. 
I'm hopeful that you've heard of several of these, but we have here the break-even analysis. Obviously, when will you break even, your profits be zero. Understanding fixed versus variable expenses. I spoke about that a bit before. Net and gross profit margin. Understand the difference in those two. And make sure that when you're going through a case interview, if they ask you about the profit margin, you're clear on what they're talking about. Return on investment. Understand that concept and be able to do that calculation. Understanding opportunity costs and sunk costs. So opportunity costs is the cost that you're foregoing. So for instance, if I decide between a concert and a movie, if I go to the movie, my opportunity cost would be the cost or the experience of the alternative. Sunk cost is something, an expense or an expenditure that has already taken place, so it no longer needs to be factored into your decision going forward. Either way, you've already spent that money, so it's not going to play into your future decision making. If you don't know those terms or aren't comfortable with speaking to those terms, be sure to look up some examples. Understand the compound annual growth rate, a very important equation. Product life cycles, being able to speak to the different stages that a product travels through. So I think a very common example is thinking about the Apple iPhone. When the Apple iPhone was first um, introduced, there were early adopters and the masses came on and then it started to trickle off a bit. So understand the product life cycle. Talk about elasticity, both on supply and demand, so how much something changes or someone would be willing to buy something based on certain factors. Understand that concept and then you may be asked to do very basic financial statement analysis. So here's an income statement. What does this mean to you? Or here's a balance sheet. How is the company doing? So very important to have a high-level understanding of the basic financial statements. And again, that's an income statement would be very important for you to understand. A balance sheet would be very important for you to understand. I would doubt that you would get any other statement, but understand the 101s of financial statements. So as I've said, a lot of students claim that starting is the most difficult process. So here are some tips. I think something that's not on this slide that should be is listen. A lot of times, as an interviewer is giving context to the solution, so they may give you two to three minutes of information. Sometimes they give up to five minutes of information because they're seeing, can you hear everything that I'm saying? Can you catch the details? Are you really truly listening to what I'm saying? Maybe half of the things that I told you aren't applicable to the problem that you're trying to solve. Can you understand that? So listen carefully and take good notes. The worst thing a student can do in the early stages of answering a case interview is to start solving before the interviewer is done speaking. You want to gather all the information, make sure you understand it, and then start solving. So a good way to start is to summarize the question. Once the interviewer stops speaking, take a look through your notes, ask for a minute to process everything, and then say something along the lines of, I understand that this, this, and this, this are the case. This is the context that's set. And the question is X. If you miss something or if you caught a detail incorrectly, they'll correct you at that stage, which is a better stage than further on in the process. Again, make sure you understand the objectives, ask your clarifying questions, lay out your structure, and then some organizations, some consultancies, like you to actually have a hypothesis. So if the case interview question were to be something around a lack of profitability, and they give you a set of information, you have mapped out that profitability breakdown tree on your notes and showed them that you're structuring your thoughts, you could say something along the lines of, from the information I have at this point, my hunch is that the problem rests on the cost side. Perhaps the fixed or variable costs are causing this problem, but I'd like to get more information to confirm this. And then you walk through all of the stages of the case. So some typical scenarios that are important and that come up in a lot of the interviews that you're going to see. Profit and loss, this is number one. You will see a profit and loss case. 
at some point in your career. Entering a new market, so the concept of where should you go, how should you go, in what manner should you go. Pricing, so you have a new product, how will you price it, how will you determine a proper pricing. And then growth and increased sales. So I'll go through these. Profit and loss are, again, it's the most common type of case question. They require a student to understand the bottom line, profit, costs, and revenues. So understand that there are multiple components that go into this. Some key questions that I've listed here, is the company the market leader? What is the size of the company? What have been the recent industry trends? What is the product mix and who are the customers? These are very important if you're in the situation where it's an interviewee-led case. You'll need to know this information to determine why this is happening. The thing that I've started, the equation that I've started is of course, within the parentheses, profit is revenue minus costs. But we also want you to think of, one, the market, so the M, the market in that industry, and two, the overall economy. If, say, Harley-Davidson sales have tanked the last year, it may be nothing to do with anything they're doing, so inside the parentheses is the organization. It may not have anything to do with the motorcycle market. It may be that the U.S. economy has tanked. And if you don't ask questions about both the macro economy and the market, and you assume that it's a problem with the organization, it's not a comprehensive analysis of the situation. So make sure you go big. So what's happening in the macro economy? What's happening in the industry? Okay, now let me see what's happening in this profit and loss tree that I've drawn out. Entering a new market. These are pretty straightforward. I actually think these are very easy for students and students tend to like them because I find them easier to master. Um, but these typically have components of mergers and acquisitions or joint ventures. So if you don't understand a joint venture, you don't understand a merger and acquisition, be sure to look those terms up and find some examples of either of those situations. And when you think about entering a new market question, you want to first ask questions about the, the company. You want to determine the state of the current and future market. So again, if we use the Harley-Davidson example, Ask questions about how they're doing. Have they grown in the last couple of years? What is their business model? How do they make money? What is their product mix? Then you move into understanding the state of the motorcycle industry. Is it growing? Are there a lot of new competitors? Are people interested in this industry? Investigate the market to determine whether or not to enter. So looking forward at a new market, say you want to move Harley-Davidson into Asia. Look at the Asian market for motorcycles. Are there a lot of competitors there? Is there an interest in that sort of transportation? Is it seen as a leisure? If you decide on entry, you must also explain how. So if you go through all of these questions and you determine that it would be a sound business decision to enter this new market, you must discuss how you'd like to enter. So do you think going in with a partnership with a local business is the best deal? Or do you think going in by yourself is a better deal? So think about the timing of the entry and also how you would accomplish that. So pricing. How do you price a product or a service? You first need to investigate the company. Then you need to think about the product. And then you need to determine the pricing strategy. So this is important because if you're a luxury company, for instance, you don't want to price the product at a very low price point and deteriorate the brand of your company. So something to think about. Understand the product. Is it something that's brand new? Or is it, again, a Red Ocean situation where there are a lot of people providing this offering and you're just another person offering this, at which point price might be where you have to rely on getting more people. And then there are three ways to determine the pricing strategy, or three common pricing strategies. One, and I think probably the most straightforward and easiest to grasp, is a competitive analysis. What are my competitors charging for this? Um, are they charging a really high premium? Are the margins being on this? I don't want to be substantially different than my competitors unless I'm using price as my selling point. 
I will caveat that getting into a price war with people is very dangerous, especially as a smaller company, because you will be at the mercy of your suppliers. So if you go very low with your price, you're shrinking your margins and shrinking your profitability. So note that going lower on price is not always the best solution. Cost-based pricing. So figuring out what the supplies to make that product or what all of the components to deliver that service cost you and then bake in a margin on top of that. So say that it costs you $10 to make a certain T-shirt and you determine that it's appropriate to earn an extra $3 on top of that. You've just done some cost-based pricing. You've gone from the cost and then you've determined a price that's appropriate. Price-based pricing, this is a very strange term, but it's essentially how much will people pay for this? Getting a sense for what the demand for this product or service is and pricing based on what you think your target audience will pay. So those are three strategies. Growth and increased sales, and this is, I believe, the last one that we're going to go through. But if you're asked to increase sales, Note that that is very different than increasing profits. This is a very common mistake. So sales is the amount you've sold. Profits is your bottom line. Increasing sales is increasing your volume, your revenue, or both. Increasing profits means that you are making more money. Very different. So learn about the company both the size and the resources, and investigate the industry. How are things going? So think about the industry as a whole and the macro economy to get insights into how to grow your sales or grow your profit. Clarify if you are unclear at what they're asking for. Clarify with the interviewer. Are you asking me to increase how many T-shirts I sell? Or are you asking me how can I make the company more money? If you get stuck. So as I said, it is not uncommon for a student or an experienced hire to get stuck during the case interview. There's a lot of information coming at you. You may have already had two or three interviews, behavioral or technical, that day. You're probably very nervous. If you're excited about the company, you're probably very nervous. So it's not a deal breaker if you get stuck. And here are some things that I suggest. Recap where you've been. If you are absolutely at a drop dead, I cannot move this further, go back and look at those notes. Hopefully you've taken detailed logical notes and you can follow what your logic train was up to that point and recap them and share with your interviewer what you're doing. You can say even, I'm a bit stuck, let me review where I've been and go through your notes with them. Don't pull out every detail. That's very important whether you're talking about delivering a solution, providing your final answer and summarize summarizing the case, pull out the highlights. Review the information from the interviewer. So go back to that initial content they gave you or if along the way they gave you tips and you wrote those down, make sure you review that and say it out loud. Well, you told me X, Y, Z. So run through your frameworks. So if all else fails and you're just very nervous and you haven't made any progress, Think about those two basic frameworks, the five C's and the four P's, and see if any of those words or those concepts can jog an area that you haven't yet explored. So I'm talking about this product, but, oh, I didn't talk about the promotion at all, or I didn't talk about the place that we would be selling this. It's a great way to jog your memory. If you want to draw it out, too, that's helpful, I think, just to get all of your thoughts on paper. And last but not least, asking for help. A lot of people think that this is a cop-out and that it will be a strike against them. Very rarely will it be a strike against you. I think if you ask for help sparingly, so don't start the case, do no work, and then say, I don't know, can you give me some help? That's not going to work. But asking for help if you're truly stuck You've recapped where you've been, you've talked about the key facts that they gave you, you've tried to recall a simple framework, and you just don't know where to go. Saying, you know, I'm a bit stuck. Is there any other information that you can give me that could help me move in the right direction? That's fine. Then the interviewer may have a tip or two that will prod you in the right direction. So make sure you hear that tip 
and you think about it thoughtfully and make an attempt at a step forward. I think it's very important to note that this is not the same as not trying. So there have been students that I have interviewed that the moment I introduce a case question, they say they don't know, and they won't go forward with the case, and they're looking for more and more information from me to help guide them. Those are students that are most likely going to be disqualified from being a viable candidate for us because they haven't given it a shot, they haven't broken down the problem statement into different components, and they're waiting for me to give them information rather than really trying to problem solve themselves. But asking for help when you're truly stuck, not a negative. So this is just a summary of some do's and don'ts. A lot of these are very logical and deal with both the behavioral and the technical, but also a bit of the case interview. But I'll go through these really quickly. Things not to do in an interview. This is a no-brainer, I hope, but bad in mouthing previous employers. Even if you worked for the most terrible human being on the face of the planet before this, this is not the forum to badmouth them. Um, no matter what, you want to spin the people that you worked for before in a positive light or at least a neutral light. Um, Bad-mouthing previous employers indicates to a potential future employer that either you are difficult to work with or you're going to do that to them in the future or you don't have the tact to censor yourself. So make sure you don't do that. If somebody challenges you, so in some types of cases, they may actually challenge you. Why do you think that? Or is that really the case? Sometimes you're perfectly spot on with the answer, and they're just seeing how you respond under pressure. Don't get aggressive or defensive. And this goes back to the point on be coachable. If they give you a piece of information that you hadn't thought of before, don't get defensive with them. Make sure you are thoughtful about it and stick to your answer or change it based on the new information they provided. Don't ask open-ended questions. I don't know, how do I get there? If you're in the middle of a case, open-ended questions indicate that you aren't trying hard enough and they aren't going to give you that information. Ask closed-ended questions. So for instance, is there another competitor in this field? Yes. How many? Number. Ask questions like that so you actually show them that you know the content that you're looking for. Don't give long and drawn out answers. Mumbling is a terrible thing and shows that you can't analyze your thoughts and make them more concise. Try to be as concise as is possible while still being effective. And don't speak without thinking. Always ask for a minute if you need a second to collect your thoughts, to organize your notes, to review the material they gave you. That is absolutely fine. It's even possible for once you write down your notes or you write down a format, to turn your paper around and show the interviewer what's happening. Here's how I thought about it. Gives them a sense of how you're logicking your way through it. Do engage the interviewer. Asking them good questions at the end of, end of the interview is key. Don't ask questions for the sake of asking questions. We know when students are doing that, it's not engaging to us, and it actually seems a bit fluffy and like they're trying to fill time. But if you have a real question about what working there would be like or a question unique to you, hey, I really enjoy sports, and there's a sports league that meets on a Thursday night at 7.30. I know that we might be working long hours, but is this something that the firm would be willing to work with me on because it's important to me? Great question. It's about their life. It's about how their experience would go with that organization. Be happy to answer a question like that. Also, be friendly as you're engaging. Having a positive attitude and exuding a friendliness and approachability, that's very important for an interviewer. Your answers should be kept between 30 seconds and two minutes. If I ask a student to walk me through their resume and they speak for five minutes, you've lost me. I absolutely don't remember what you said and all I've noted down is that you aren't articulate or efficient in your speech. So make sure that you keep your answers short, concise. So if you need that time to think, take it and then make sure you're using that one minute in the best way possible. Again, asking genuine questions, structuring your thought, and be positive and energetic. Very important. One other thing that I haven't touched base on during this call and during this workshop is the difference between taking a case on phone and in person. 
those are two different dynamics. So for me, when I take a case at home, I do the exact same thing that I do when I'm staring at a person, but I articulate what I'm writing in more detail. You need to be explicit about what's happening. So the long silences are for a reason, not just because you're stalling or because you don't have an answer. So after an interviewer would present to me an idea or a concept and give me context to the problem, I might say, okay, I'm going to take a minute to write things down, if you could give me one second. And then as soon as I'm done, I say, okay, I'm ready, and what I've written down, and I walk them through what I'm writing and how I'm structuring my thoughts. It's very important. It's important to be explicit in person as well. Another trick that I think a lot of students um, overlook is the concept of using your calculator while you're taking a case inter interview from home. I don't suggest it, only insofar as a really good interviewer knows when you're using a calculator. If you are going quick, if I can hear a click, click, click in the back, if you don't say out loud, so sometimes when you're doing a calculation, you might say, okay, and then you carry the three and da, 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 da lets me know you're actually doing out the calculation. Whereas oftentimes I feel that students that use calculators <laughs> go very quickly, they just tell me a number, and they haven't told me how they got there. So be careful with that. Otherwise, the two case interviews, whether it's at home or in person, are very similar. And people have different um, styles that they like better. So if you're practicing and you have the opportunity to, practice a case over the phone and then practice a case with somebody in person. The more you can practice with somebody, the better you're going to be at this because a case interview practice on your own is not at all like what you will experience in real life. And you want that pressure of having to speak on the spot and speak articulately to somebody else who's in the room and sharing that presence in the room. So like we promised, um, here are some cases to practice a few that I would suggest if you're just starting out with cases, and there are an array of different levels of cases in this book, and there are other books if you're interested that we can give you information on. But the cases that are a great starting point and really test some of the concepts we've reviewed today are the Grupo Modelo case, Stuck, KBO Appliances, and Satine Blue. That one is a bit more challenging, so I've noted that here. But try to go through those. Again, if you can convince a roommate or you can convince one of your parents or a sibling to sit through and do one of these cases with you, that's going to be the best practice. So that is it for our first workshop. We're going to have a second workshop that you will experience over the course of your work with Modern Guild. If you have any questions about some of the concepts that we've covered today or things were unclear, feel free to research on your own, but also feel free to jot down any questions and discuss it with your career coach. They're happy to give you the answers that you need and discuss any topics in more depth. You're also going to be practicing some of these skills in your LMI, so your live mock interviews. They're going to be both behavioral and technical, and then you'll have the opportunity to go through a case interview. And this will really test your abilities live, and the person conducting your live mock interview will be able to give you feedback after you go through the case. So this is a great forum to test out those skills. Thank you guys so much, and if you have any questions, again, feel free to reach out to the Modern Guild team. Thank you.